And the good morning to everybody. I think I came to this meeting uh, for the first time in 1993 uh, when I was a fellow at UCLA. So it's, uh, it's nice to see uh, old, and I mean old underscore uh, friends. So my challenge today is talk, to talk to you about uh, Nash, the next frontier. And um, I have nothing to disclose. I guess I was asked to provide pre and post um, uh, questions, and so I, let's just start off. I don't have anything. We, I don't think we've uh, have any fancy uh, way of, of scanning uh, responses. So let's just do by, by the show of hands. So the first question is a true false. Uh, Natural defects appro approximately 15 percent of the U.S. population. True or false? Who says true? Who says false? Okay. Good. The answer is false. We'll talk about the prevalence is probably twice, twice this. Uh, NAFLD is associated with which of the following? Diabetes, sleep apnea, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, um, development of hepatocellular carcinoma without cirrhosis, or all of the above? All of the above. Good. And um, the last question is a small fraction of NAFLD and NASH drugs in the pipeline target a specific aspect of the immune response? True or false? Just a small fraction. Okay, I'll convince you otherwise. So my outline, I want to talk about disease prevalence and comorbidities, um, disease associations, uh, screening guidelines, cardiovascular disease uh, risk and malignancy risk, how to make the diagnosis, including emerging uh, imaging assessments, indication for liver biopsy, which I think is a really important clinical question we face when we're seeing a patient in clinic with NAFLD. Should we do a biopsy? What's the natural history of this disease? We know it's highly variable. And what do patients with NASH die of? And that's a discussion I frequently have with patients. I'm not concerned about you dying of liver disease. I'm really more concerned about your cardiovascular stroke uh, and stroke risk. And then treatment options, diets, uh, current and emerging pharmacologic agents. So we use this NAFL, this umbrella term, and that encompasses, of course, bland steatosis, which is defined as more than 5% hepatic steatosis without ballooning. Now, we, we start to define NASH as a phenotype. It includes steatosis. It's indispensable for that diagnosis. But in a large proportion of the time, there is ballooning. Is it necessary to have ballooning? No, it turns out that ballooning is not always present. Uh, but it should be present to cinch that diagnosis of NASH. And inflammation is absolutely necessary to make that diagnosis of NASH. NAFLD is a global health problem. Uh, this shows you the prevalence data using a radiologic NAFLD uh, diagnosis. <clears throat> and you can see that in the U.S., the prevalence is about 24 percent, 24 percent to 35 percent, depending on which part of the country you live in. And this means that uh, 2 to 6 percent of the general population in the U.S. has NASH. You can see that the prevalence varies across uh, the world. Uh, Middle East has a very high uh, prevalence of this condition, as is South America. And so currently it's estimated 64 million people with NAFLD uh, are in the U.S., and that number is going to become 100 million by 2030. Um, this week I was asked to uh, provide some slides to the dean's office to talk about um, the importance of our liver center. And Dr. Kaplowitz uh, has had a liver center since 1995, and I, I've, I'm now the director of that liver center. And at the first line I had was liver disease affects 4.5 million people in the U.S. And then I said, wait a minute, what about NAFLD? <laughs> so it dwarfs all the other diagnoses in this country. And so again, 64 million people in the U.S. have NAFLD. 10% of children are affected. It's closely linked to the global prevalence and trends for type 2 diabetes and the growing ep epidemic of obesity. We know that um, ethnicity largely determines uh, the prevalence of, of NAFLD and NASH, and you can see here that Hispanics as a whole have a much higher prevalence than other ethnic uh, groups. Also turns out that uh, there are differences according to birth country. 
Um, I'm grateful that I'm of Cuban descent, uh, so I can eat whatever I want, uh, but you can see, see that the Mexican and the Central American, largely the population that we see uh, in LA County, has a particularly high prevalence of NAFLD. We also know there's a genetic association with PMP-LA3. It's the first uh, genetic polymorphism associated by a GWAS study or a genome-wide association study from the Dallas Heart Study associating a genetic mutation uh, or variation uh, with the prevalence of NAFLD. And what this gene does, it's important in terms of <coughs> uh, it, the accumulation of the fatty, uh, uh, fatty acids in the liver and also export of fatty acids from hepatocytes. So it has an important role in lipid metabolism. And we know it's, it's a risk factor for more advanced NAFLD, cirrhosis, and liver cancer. Uh, the rates of PNPLA3 mutations in Hispanic populations compared to African Americans, it's about twice as, as prevalent. And again, it's correlated strongly with the prevalence in Hispanics. This shows you this one particular uh, mutation, the I148M, which is associated with uh, increased hepatic uh, fat levels and increased ALT. And so we talk about uh, metabolic syndrome, we think of it as a really a constellation of different um, diseases, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. And if you have more than two of those, then you have metabolic syndrome. This graphic shows you that NASH is associated with a very high burden of metabolic comorbidities. So 82% of people who have NASH are obese. Under half have type 2 diabetes. And there's this bi-directional association so that <clears throat> patients who have diabetes are more likely to develop NAFLD, and patients uh, who have diabetes are also more likely to develop advanced NASH. And the more metabolic conditions, the higher the risk for advanced fibrosis, and the, the lower the chance of histologic reversal with weight loss. And we'll talk about the importance of, of weight loss um, be it through lifestyle changes or even through bariatric surgery. And you'll have those patients who still have residual inflammation, have lost their weight but still have residual inflammation. And those are patients who often have other comorbid conditions. So back to what I said earlier, when I see a patient with NAFLD, yes, I'm focused on liver disease as a hepatologist, but I'm also focused on all the other conditions that will ultimately kill them. Is routine screening indicated for NAFLD? Well, we know that NAFLD increases the risk of premature cardiovascular disease and associated mortality. And one could very simply make a case that we should screen for NAFLD um, to facilitate early diagnosis and to prevent complications, be they hepatic or extrahepatic. Uh, however, a recent Markov model uh, screening was not found to be cost effective at present, uh, because of the disutility of available treatment. That means we don't really have good treatments for this condition. And so if we screen all these patients, it's not going to be cost effective. I think that's definitely going to change in the next few years. What are the current diagnostic tools for NASH and fibrosis? Well, the basics. Imaging to establish the presence of steatosis. You have to start somewhere. Important to take a meticulous alcohol and medication history. There was a study that was published in Hepatology at uh, 59,000 Korean patients with NAFLD. And they found that a moderate amount of alcohol, and that's what I've shown you here, 10 to 20 grams a day in women, or 10 to 30 grams a day in men. So this is half of what the typical threshold is to cause alcoholic-related liver disease. A moderate amount of alcohol in a patient who has NAFLD is associated with the fibrosis uh, development and progression to cirrhosis and liver-related mortality. So it's really important for us to take a meticulous history when patients come into clinic and don't dismiss, you know, what, what we consider uh, alcohol consumption uh, that may not be at the threshold for alcoholic-related liver disease. Of course, you have to exclude coexisting conditions, competing etiologies, You'll check autoantibodies and, and ferritin, those are often elevated. Um, 
they're usually epiphenomena, but if you have a ferritin above 1.5 upper limits of normal, that's associated with uh, uh, fi higher rate of fibrosis. So I always check a ferritin in these patients. Fasting lipid profile and measures of insulin resistance. Liver enzymes can be normal, and I've added a slide to the, the deck that I um, didn't have when I first submitted the slides. We'll, we'll talk about that, a recent study from the CRN showing that about 43% of patients with NAFLD have normal liver function tests at some point in time. And, of course, liver biopsy to establish the presence of NASH in selected patients. So we have a lot of tools um, that we can utilize uh, non-invasively to diagnose NASH and NAFLD. And uh, these include clinical lab tests, um, underscoring the NFS, the NAFLD fibrosis score. It's pretty complicated to figure out. Uh, the FIB4 score, much easier to figure out. All the other, all these other uh, tests that are used, imaging, and then biomarkers. In particular, CK18 appears to be promising. The Europeans have developed this ELF score, which appears to be very, very promising as well. And so the FIB4 score um, can be applied to large populations of patients. It's shown here. It's based on the AST, ALT, and platelet count. That's the website for the calculator. Uh, it predicts advanced fibrosis with a very high specificity. And it does have a reasonable correlation, head-to-head um, -head comparison with MRI and liver biopsy. And importantly, its longitudinal changes predicts changes in fibrosis. So Arun Sanyal, uh, a good friend of mine, is a very uh, strong advocate for the FIB4 score uh, to screen large populations of patients. If you have a threshold, if you have above the threshold of 3.25, that patient has a one in five chance of developing a liver-related event in the next five years. So pretty remarkable, um, simple test, and uh, I certainly calculate it whenever I see a patient in clinic. There's this NAFLD fibrosis score, NFS, which um, <clears throat> Dr. Kaplowitz can probably do this in his head when he sees a patient, but most of us, most of us can't. Uh, but these are the six variables, uh, age, BMI, AST-LT ratio, uh, diabetes, platelet count, and albumin. <clears throat> and it's an independent predictor of advanced fibrosis uh, or cirrhosis. It also predicts um, long-term outcomes in individuals with NAFLD. So, you remember the TV commercials got milk, and so well, <clears throat> what if you've got normal LFTs? And this is a new slide to the, the slide deck. <clears throat> Pardon me. You can still have advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. This was a study from 534 patients, uh, NASH patients enrolled in the Clinical Research Network, the NIH CRN. These patients had an AST less than 40 within three months of liver biopsy. 43% of the patients in the cohort had normal LOTs. <laughs> What's the score of the game? <laughs> and when you look at these patients, they have a biopsy. Uh, 35% of the patients had NASH, 20% had F2 or F3, which really uh, is concerning, and 7% had cirrhosis, despite having normal liver function tests. So um, normal LFTs uh, should not assure us uh, that the patient is not at risk of developing advanced disease. Multiple logistic regression for the finding of F2 to F3 include type 2 diabetes, LDL actually increased risk with the lower uh, level of LDL, so, somewhat counterintuitive. Uh, white patients versus non-whites uh, were at higher risk. Again, the AST-LT ratio, which is consistent in a lot of models, platelets, triglycerides, and history of hypertension. A couple of uh, caveats about all the modalities we currently have, and there are a lot of uh, approaches we have uh, at our fingertips now, and these include transient elastography, this acoustic radiation force impulse, and these have limitations, however, in the setting of obesity, ascites, acute inflammation. There's also a wide range in terms of availability, accessibility, and accuracy. So MRE certainly is um, a great modality, as we'll talk about. It's highly accurate. It, um, it still has uh, some limitations, but it's, it's, um, it's very accurate in mo most cases. And a lot of studies are now using MRE uh, 
uh, in lieu of a liver biopsy. So the fiber scan is obviously what is the most widely used the VCTE. Um, more than 10 images are required. It's very accurate for staging F3 to F4. It can also estimate steatosis when used with uh, the cap. Uh, shear wave elastography can be used to measure stiffness in a single region of interest, shown here. And then MRE, uh, besides providing really pretty pictures, measures stiffness across multiple uh, regions of interest. These are data from Rahut, uh, so Rohit Lumba, who's at UCSD. And he's a very strong proponent of the MRI PDFF, or the proton density fat fraction, uh, which we actually have available at USC. Um, it's not affected by many confounding variables and other modalities, including age, sex, BMI, etiology of liver disease. And it's not affected by iron overload or necroinflammation. We now know that the, the mere presence of fat on the liver bio, I'm sorry, on a MRI PDFF is associated with fibrosis progression. So the um, lower levels of liver fat is associated with a much lower risk of developing advanced fibrosis as compared to those patients who have higher levels of fat by MRI uh, PDFF. And there are some thresholds that you may want to be familiar with. Again, this is in the materials that were provided in terms of uh, MRE less than 2.55 or above 3.63 in terms of lower risk or higher risk of fibrosis. And um, this, these thresholds are now being used in patients because patients don't want to get liver biopsies before and after treatment. And so uh, a relative decline of 30% from baseline is associated with a two-point improvement in NAFLD activity score. So it's a very nice uh, surrogate approach um, to determine improvement in patients undergoing research trials. Uh, this is actually probably the most fundamental question is when you see a patient in clinic, who should get a liver biopsy? And <clears throat> patients with metabolic syndrome, we've, we've talked about, they have a higher risk of inflammation. Uh, patients with diabetes in particular have a higher rate of fibrosis. Um, FIV4 score, or NFS score above a threshold, should probably get a liver biopsy. What about family history? We'll talk about that momentarily. But the answer is yes. I think people who have a family history of NAFLD, especially advanced um, liver disease related to NAFLD, should get a liver biopsy. Uh, we never remind our surgical colleagues that uh, when a cholecystectomy is being performed or bariatric surgery, what well, we remind them, it just doesn't get done, uh, have a liver biopsy at the time. I think it's really important. Old age and then persistently increased LFTs despite weight loss. Again, as I mentioned, not everybody uh, improves their LFTs despite significant weight loss. This shows you the natural history of, of uh, NASH. Um, on average, the fibrosis progression rate in NASH, it's a little slower than hepatitis C. It's one stage per uh, every seven years. Uh, we know that 20% of patients are fast progressors and develop cirrhosis within 10 years. And again, it starts with about 20 million Americans. Two to 6% of the general population has NASH. And these patients will develop advanced fibrosis. These patients can go on to develop cirrhosis, as we know. And uh, in the very near future, it will overtake all viral etiologies. And alcohol is a leading indication for liver transplantation in the Western world. We also note, as you all uh, correctly answered before the talk, that Patients can go on to develop HCC without developing fibrosis, which is a scary prospect. Again, underscoring the risk of death in NASH. First is cardiovascular disease, second is cancer, and third is liver-related mortality. <clears throat> in terms of the presence on liver biopsy that predicts um, outcome, we know that ballooning is, is present frequently. It doesn't really have much prognostic value. Uh, once you have portal inflammation, it's certainly the presence of fibrosis is the most important predictor of long-term mortality, this leaning tower of, of Pisa here. And uh, this is shown graphically in this very nice study from a few years ago in hepatology, 
that once you get to stage three fibrosis, the mortality rate really takes off. And at stage four, you can see that the relative risk has gone up 23-fold. Uh, the consequences of inaction will be serious, uh, very serious. A uh, number of those with cirrhosis related to NAFL will triple in the next 12 years. Uh, over 300,000 people will have end-stage liver disease, and many of these are today's children's. And NAFL is driving the national increase in, in liver cancer. So if we look at overall uh, mortality in, in cancers, it's actually decreasing. Colorectal significant improvement in terms of uh, decrease in mortality. Liver cancer is still increasing. So when we think of patients who come to see us um, with NAFLD, remember that patients with NAFLD-related liver cancer are older, have a shorter survival time once they're diagnosed with HCC. They more often have heart disease, which complicates uh, liver transplant as a modality will likely die from their primary liver cancer than other HCC patients. And in a large VA cohort study, around 13% of HCC patients did not have cirrhosis. And among the key factors, NAFLD was independently associated with HCC in the absence of cirrhosis. This was a study from a uh, nurse's health study. It was, it was pretty interesting that it found uh, the presence of diabetes associated with uh, increased risk, five times uh, increased risk in women, three and a half times in men in terms of incident HCC. And the duration of diabetes also increased the risk of incident HCC. Is NAFLD associated with development of non-liver cancers? What do you folks think? Yes. And uh, these are data that Alina Allen, uh, she hasn't published them yet, uh, but at the Mayo Clinic presented at uh, last year's ASLD. And again, this is Olmsted County, so it's uh, predominantly white uh, uh, cohort, but just about 5,000 patients uh, who had NAFLD. And when she looked at the incidence ratio of different uh, cancers in NAFLD versus control, she found a significant relative risk increase in, in liver, as you'd expect, but also uterus, stomach, pancreas, and colon. So overall, about a two-fold increased risk in developing non-liver cancers. And so again, it's a discussion I have with my patients in terms of motivating them to lose weight. I'm not so concerned about your uh, liver disease right now. I'm more concerned about all the other conditions associated with NAFL that's untreated. And shown here is just gender differences. Again, liver being at the top of the list, which is a nice validation that their analysis um, you know, it was done properly. But again, a lot of other cancers associated with the presence of NAFLD. And we've known for a long time that obesity is a driver of, of cancers. So what do patients die of? Um, well, we know that patients who have NAFLD have increased overall mortality compared to match controls without NAFLD. So that's the first thing uh, you can tell your patients. The most common cause of death, as mentioned several times, is cardiovascular disease. And this is independent of other metabolic uh, comorbidities. And although liver-related mortality is the 12th leading cause of death in the general population, it's the second cause of death among patients who have NAFLD. And cancer-related mortality is the top three causes of death in patients who have NAFLD. So it really is the confluence of multiple factors uh, that are critical to developing metabolic syndrome. These include genetics. We've talked about PMPLA3, but there are a number of other genetic polymorphisms associated with an increased risk of developing NAFLD, and in those patients who have NAFLD, of developing NASH, and more importantly, NASH-related fibrosis and cirrhosis. Other factors, as we'll talk about, economic, social, cultural, uh, political, I would say geopolitical. And um, we talked briefly about the fact that patients, uh, relatives of patients with NASH cirrhosis have a 12-fold increased risk of having advanced NASH fibrosis. Now, that's probably because of, obviously, shared genetics, but it's also the household. And I, I, you know, I remember when I was in Colorado having a discussion with a patient who we were evaluating for, for liver transplant who had NAFLD-related cirrhosis, a very large person. I look around the room, and you know, everybody around the room is a large person. And so you want to have a discussion with the 60-year-old woman's daughter, you know, if you 
don't change, you're going to end up in the same. So I think that's really important to consider taking care of the whole uh, family. Uh, lifestyle and liver disease. Uh, so this is 80 million tweets. I don't like tweeting. But um, th this shows you, interestingly, that in areas where there are positive sentiments towards healthy foods and physical activity, that's associated with lower obesity and mortality. And um, conversely, physical inactivity in fast foods, and again, I'll just kind of highlight some areas here in the deep south, are, are linked to obesity rates per county. So uh, modifiable um, factors. It's also interesting that the, the access to healthy foods is limited in areas of greatest obesity. And so, again, in, in the deep south, where you have uh, a lot of areas where there's no car, uh, no supermarket store within a mile, you have much higher rates of obesity on a per county level. And so, I think what we, we face is really the biggest challenge is changing behavior. That has to be the top priority to improve out outcomes from NAFLD, uh, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, and reduced cancer. This is La, living La Vida Sofa, and this is uh, what Dr. Donovan looks like on most Sunday afternoons. Um, <laughs> I have to give him a boy, or, or during the week, I should say. <laughs> And I don't have to tell this, this audience that you know, physical inactivity is a major cause of chronic, uh, chronic disease and, and ill health. Uh, you're all well aware of that. And you know, d disordered sleep is really emerging as a very common um, and important driver of, of outcomes. And as I mentioned to you, as, as you all knew, sleep apnea is an important driver of, of NAFLD. And so we know that patients who have sleep apnea have a higher uh, rate of fibrosis uh, severity. This was a study, again, from Arun Sanyo. It was a very clever study, and it, it addresses uh, the issue of the caregivers uh, taking care of uh, the patients who have NAFLD. And in this study, almost 80% of uh, the caregivers, uh, so nearly threefold higher prevalence than the general population, had NAFLD. Okay, so you're talking to a patient, telling them to change their lifestyle, you're sending them back home, but 80% of the people taking care of them also have NAFLD. Uh, have a dis disproportionately higher uh, obesity, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and when queried, they have a greater daily intake, uh, energy intake, and consumption of saturated fats and carbohydrates. And only 12% of the individuals were aware of their diagnosis. And uh, again, I think it's really important to consider the shared environmental factors uh, that may, may have a profound impact on our management of these patients. You know, when I see a patient with, with, uh, with, with NAFLD, uh, I think we have to look back and say, well, when did the disease actually start? You know, just like when we were taking care of patients with hepatitis C, we, we asked, well, what, was the risk, what were the risk factors? And, and here we know that NAFLD often starts in the pediatric phase. And so uh, looking at the long view of this disease, it's a disease that I, I think as, as we understand more of it, it's, it's really not about treating someone for 48 weeks. It may require lifelong therapy, just like diabetes does. And I apologize for this busy slide. I just wanted you to have it in, in your slide deck, and we can go through each, each point. But weight loss and increased physical activity are pillars, are the cornerstones of treatment. Those are really hard to achieve for patients, right? But it really fundamentally starts with weight loss and uh, modifiable risk factors. And I always query the patients in, in clinic about soft drinks, fast foods, uh, to avoid those. And the recommended weight loss is about 5 to 10 percent. And I'll show you the data uh, by Villar uh, Gomez uh, showing why we use that threshold for weight loss. Uh, so a reduction of body weight, uh, 3 to 5 percent, may improve hepatic steatosis. But to reduce hepatic inflammation, you need at least 5 percent, 5 to 10 percent to reduce uh, hepatic inflammation. And I try to stay away from very low calorie diets. Uh, I don't think they're appropriate in our patients with liver disease because they're often sarcopenic. And so sarcopenia is defined simply as low muscle mass, low strength. And we, we also now know that you know, the, this combination, this somewhat paradoxical combination, a patient comes to see you where they're obese and they have very little muscle, muscle mass those are the patients who have a much higher risk of having F3, F4 fibrosis. So as part of their lifestyle change, if they're not lifting weights, even low level, 
um, uh, weights, I actually put a lot of patients on, on a regimen to, to build muscle mass. So sarcopenia is a very, um, very worrisome finding in patients who have NAFLD. And again, the, the diet of choice should not be a fad diet where somebody does it for three months, loses 40 pounds, and then they gain 50 pounds after that. So whatever diet that most likely to adhere uh, to for years. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of this. It's, it's, in, it's in the handout. The slides are available. But you know, our approach to patients who are obese or overweight versus normal weight is different. In addition to the energy restriction and looking closely at the dietary composition, again, physical activity is really important, recommended you know, three times per week at least, aerobics, and resistance at least two times per week. Is there a role for these nutraceuticals, uh, coffee, antioxidants, probiotics? I, I don't know. There may be. Diet options and factoids, and it's funny because I get asked this question a lot, and I'm not a, a dietitian or... <laughs> I don't know much about nutrition, but I want to give you uh, three, three areas to, to highlight. The Mediterranean diet uh, has a lot of benefits. It's high in antioxidants, anti-inflammatory. The paleo diet, um, it, it's a good option, actually, for our patients. Um, it's shown to have a significant and persistent effect on liver fat, and it's better than conventional low-fat diet at six months, and that's probably because it's more palatable. Uh, the ketogenic diet, um, which is popular in the general population, uh, I think we have to realize that the fat intake uh, for a 2,000 calorie diet per day uh, is between 45 and 78 grams uh, of fat, which is about three times what is recommended. So in, in humans, we know that the keto diet, some paradoxically, is associated with a significant reduction in total cholesterol, increases in HDL decreases in triglycerides and reductions in LDL cholesterol. In rodents, however, the ketogenic, where it's been studied, um, ketogenic diet induces hepatic inflammation and NAFLD. But again, these have not been studied in, in humans. So, you know, I think you're going to be uh, bombarded, especially now if I'm in California, I'm seeing a lot of patients with, you know, what diet should I be on? So I've included these slides, which uh, I hope you find helpful. Uh, this was a paper that was a, a really a seminal study published in gastroenterology, and it was performed in Cuba. Um, and it, this is Dr. Villar Gomez, who's now working in Nagashal Asani's group. And when they looked at the correlation between weight loss and steatosis, uh, steatohepatitis resolution, uh, as you can see, uh, the first point is that weight loss does, does not guarantee uh, NASH resolution. So you, you had uh, some patients who had uh, significant weight loss and still did not have resolution. But on average, um, the higher the weight loss, the more likely there was resolution of steatohepatitis. And uh, fibrosis Im improvement in, in general was a trend. So the, the higher um, the weight loss, the fibrosis typically improved. Again, not a one-to-one -one correlation, and fibrosis improvement could st still occur in people who had less than the 10% uh, threshold. So you still had patients here who had fibrosis improvement despite not losing 10% uh, of their body weight. So the recommendations from this study and what I tell patients is for, for weight loss, to reverse steatosis is about 5% weight loss, steatohepatitis, 7%, and then fibrosis, you really need 10%. Again, um, with the caveat that it's, that's, there are exceptions to this. Uh, and the other point is I want to make, again, to underscore, uh, NASH resolution is, is not guaranteed if patients have metabolic syndrome. So we have to manage their other conditions. These are the practice guidelines for the ASLD for bariatric surgery. Uh, it's considered to be a, a good alternative in patients who have um, NASH or NAFL with a BMI above 35. Um, and these are studies um, that were published in JAMA looking at the improvement in coronary uh, and cardiovascular events with uh, 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 bariatrics as compared to medical therapy. Uh, this shows you the percent histologic resolution. 40% um, had histologic resolution in fibrosis. 12% interestingly had progressive uh, worsening fibrosis. And at the ASLD, we had um, one of the late-breaking abstracts uh, showing that Ruan Y gastric bypass is better than uh, sleeve gastrectomy in reversing advanced fibrosis. Uh, 
And so uh, the gastric sleeve uh, was associated with a 45% chance of a fixed fibrosis despite weight loss and metabolic improvement. And so the findings of the study they underscore the importance of staging prior to, to a surgical choice. And um, again, I think a really important observation. What about statins? Well, statins can be used safely in patients with NAFLD. Um, patients with NAFLD uh, are important targets for statins. The risk of serious hepatotoxicity from statins is very rare. Um, patients who have an early liver disease are not at, at higher risk for statin hepatotoxicity. And case series have shown histologic improvement in NASH. And, and fish oil is actually probably the first choice to treat hypertriglycidemia. So when we look at the mechanisms um, of disease progression, we can think of the metabolic overload, which is probably the first hit. It was funny because when the field was first <clears throat> being explored mechanistically, there was this hypothesis of a two-hit. It's a two-hit hypothesis. You need a metabolic overload, and then you need something else. Well, of course, it's more like 10 hits. And this shows you kind of the, the, different, the different cogs that are at play and different potential targets. And ultimately, it's really fibrosis and cirrhosis uh, development that needs to be uh, prevented. Uh, this shows you the current status of drug treatment, the impact on NASH resolution. And there actually is uh, improvement with vitamin E, uh, pioglitazone, a number of other agents have been, have been uh, tested, of course. The populations are different, however. Um, there's endpoint evolution. Uh, duration of treatment is all over the board. Um, these are the results of um, a glucagon-like uh, peptide um, that showed improvement in, um, in steatosis, but no improvement in the overall NAFLD score. It was also associated with uh, increased glycemic control, which may have been a confounding variable, increased weight loss, decreased uh, hemoglobin A1C, and we're now in a phase three trial of a related uh, class of agents. Fibrosis improvement, as you'd imagine, is not as dramatic as NASH improvement, and this shows you kind of a compendium of, of the trials that have been performed. And one of the, one of the bugaboos about pioglitazone, of course, is that it's associated with weight gain. So that's going to be a tough, tough sell for your patients who already have, have NAFL. Fibrosis improvement, this is a beta-colic acid, um, showed a dose-dependent improvement in fibrosis. And a beta-colic acid, as you know, is a synthetic derivative of chenodeoxycholic acid. It's an FXR agonist. I think as a class of drug, uh, FXR agonists have a lot of potential for a lot of diseases, not just PBC, where it's FDA approved, but certainly uh, in NASH and other liver conditions. What about vitamin E, our old friend vitamin E? So in non-diabetic, non-cirrhotic adults with NASH, vitamin E was associated with a greater resolution of NASH and significant decrease in the NAFLD activity uh, score. That was part of the PIVINS trial. In children with NASH, vitamin E uh, led to, to greater resolution of NASH and significant decrease in the, NASH, uh, the NAFLD activity score. So again, this initial study was non-diabetic, non-cirrhotic adults. These are data from Indiana University uh, from Naga Shalasani's group looking at the long-term effect of vitamin E on transplant-free survival. All these patients had bridging fibrosis or cirrhosis, and it also included patients with and without diabetes. I think this is a really impactful study. As we look at patients in clinic who have four or five comorbidities that aren't going to be enrolled in a, in a research trial, I think vitamin E is something that we need to revisit. And these, these patients took vitamin E for over two years, and you can see that in patients who took vitamin E, the transplant-free survival rate was much higher than in patients or controls who did not. And in terms of hepatic decompensation, as you'd expect, the rate of hepatic decompensation was much uh, higher in the controls than the patients who took vitamin E. So I think vitamin E is worth revisiting as a therapeutic option. There are many other agents that appear promising. Um, this is from the ASLD, and again, uh, 
don't have to worry about the names of the drugs because they will change, but these are the, the mechanism of action for these drugs and other FXR agonists. There's probably five or six uh, in the pipeline right now, PPAR agonists. And um, looking at their improvement in terms of 30% uh, relative reduction in liver fat using the MRI PDFF, uh, you can see in many cases it has a significant improvement. We talked about a 30% reduction correlating with the um, an improvement histologic score of, of two. A lot of other effects, including adverse effects that uh, may impact their applicability. What about leveraging different mechanisms? This was a study that used uh, an ASK1 inhibitor, an ACC inhibitor, and an FXR agonist. And again, you're gonna see more and more trials using combination of agents. And so I'll conclude by saying that NAFL is the most common cause of liver disease in the Western uh, Hemisphere. Uh, screening recommendations are likely to change. And I think we'll be screening many more patients now as we have new therapies that emerge as uh, efficacious. Uh, the first line of therapy, weight loss, which I understand is, twice, is, is hard to achieve, vitamin E and insulin sensitizers. Non-invasive biomarkers uh, and approaches are needed to monitor disease progression and response to therapy. At the liver meeting, there was a lot of interest in sampling of the stool microbiome and actually peripheral adipose tissue. So you can take a sample from uh, peripheral tissue and that correlates with the amount of um, injury uh, in the liver. There was one study that showed presence of IL-1 beta levels correlated with uh, NASH. Um, and so I think we're gonna see other, other approaches other than liver biopsies. Uh, cancer and cardiovascular disease are the most common causes of death. Uh, death from liver disease affects 1% to 2% of those with, with NAFLD. There are a lot of exciting drugs in the pipeline. We talked about hepatocolic acid, now in phase three, PPAR agonist, other agents. Many of these agents, in fact, target the immune system. I would say about 70% of the agents that look promising, in fact, target the immune system. And what we'll, you'll be seeing is that these trials will, will include leveraging multiple uh, mechanisms and targets to achieve a greater synergistic effect. So when we look at pre-screening uh, criteria for clinical trials, this pyramid, I think we have a gestalt of which patients have a low likelihood of NASH and fibrosis. These are factors that are associated with that. And then we also have patients that we, we put into, again, subjectively into a higher risk. I wanna underscore again, the recent observation that 43% of patients will have normal ALT and AST, and I think that's problematic for us um, in terms of predicting who has advanced disease. And it kind of reminds me of the era when we first were getting DAAs and we were trying to allocate the DAAs to the patients at highest risk for developing uh, advanced uh, uh, disease and, and poor outcome. And, and we're kind of at that juncture now where we have a lot of patients, many more patients, and we have to somehow um, risk stratify them. This is a SWOT analysis of, uh, of, of NAFLD. Um, the strengths, you know, we can achieve resolution in 40 to 50 percent with some of the agents that are available now. There are many promising repurposed drugs um, we now have general consensus on endpoints and case definitions. Weakness, the majority do not resolve NASH, and uh, no drug has been shown to prevent or reverse cirrhosis. In terms of threats, um, challenges in histologic assessment, um, variable placebo response. Uh, we know that there's a seesaw effect in the natural history, um, and now we know that LFTs can fluctuate as well. There's really no clear pathway to cure, and we don't really yet know the duration of therapy. Opportunities, uh, many targets, many of them immune targets, uh, drugs that are available for repurposing, and um, take home message, messages, exclude uh, competing etiologies and look for coexisting liver diseases. Steatosis is benign, but NASH is progressive and can lead to cirrhosis. <clears throat> Patients with NAFLD are at higher risk for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And management of NAFLD includes managing underlying metabolic, cardiovascular risk, as, as well as managing liver disease. <clears throat>
And I'd like to acknowledge uh, folks who sent me slides, and I'll stop here for questions. And I've got 43 seconds. Thank you. Okay, I've got, I've got